Hello, Rim the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against mystery of Babylon is growing all over the world. This is episode number 437. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake. I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hey, everyone. We're back after the conference, and it's good to be back in here talking to you guys. No matter what's going on, we miss talking to you. Um, We had the privilege of seeing friends at this conference and meeting so many new people, so many sweet people. We got to give hugs and just get to know people that are all across the country that are are just so loving and so wonderful, and we we were so grateful. And we want to thank you guys for praying for our family. Just some, for some reason that week, Steph and I both had trouble sleeping. As a matter of fact, the night before the conference, I didn't sleep a wink. I guess I was sitting there in my head thinking about food and different things, how to get it done. And so <clears throat> when I got up that next morning, I you know I hadn't slept anything, but I just felt so energized. And, and uh, there were several times during the conference that Steph and I were both just talking about, thank God for our partners that are praying for us. God's given us supernatural strength. And um, w- I was able to make it through both days uh, without leaving early. You know, my legs did great. And so we just couldn't do it, guys, without you. And so thank you so much for that. And um, our family was so blessed to meet Pastor Carl and Pamela Gallops. You talk about a precious pastor. Um what a message he gave. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. It's just, it's amazing what he talked about. I missed the first one. I've got to go back when Mike posts it, and, but I, I caught the last one, and it was just an amazing, amazing speech. Um, one of the things that I've been praying for is that the people that attend the conferences would meet anointed pastors that just have that that love for people because one of the things, if there's if there's been anything I think that the enemy's tried to stop is having true shepherds. Yes. Because if you can't have someone like that that shows you the love of Jesus, it's so easy to just to just think nothing's real, you know, and and you meet tons of people we have we both have that you know claim to be Christians and uh even in the ministry, but boy trying to find some love and all that is something else. I thought and, uh, I thought one of the neat things Steffi said uh that and during the conference, you know, in some of the in-between times, Carl just disappeared. I didn't know where he was. And Steffi said he was, and we have like a little cry room in the back, uh-huh. and he's in the floor <laughs> playing with the kids. Isn't that precious? I just thought that was so neat because that's one of the my heart cries is that the, the younger generation would see these precious pastors that, that just love them and how important they are. Because if you can see a representative on the earth, it's it's that – what you need to be able to connect with the Father in that way. Um, and we've had, you know, Dr. Mike Spaulding here, Pastor Paul Begley, and now Pastor Gallops. And so these, these children are getting to see the top of the top of the shepherds. They are to not only love, but, I mean, being exposed to these different anointings. Mm-hmm, that's uh, right. I, I think it's a powerful thing for these kids. And, you kids. know, they're, even the little ones, they're in that, in that presence of that when they're teaching and stuff. And so... Um, we had uh, one of the attendees at the conference came in toward the end of the conference and said that there was someone had come up, one of the neighbors had come up and complained because um, a dog had had a potty run on her, <laughs> her property. And so uh, after, the, I couldn't find her then, but after the conference we were trying on Saturday, we came in and tried to find who that person was. And we didn't, we never did find who said that, but we talked to, uh, the chairman of the city council, which is directly behind our parking lot, mm-hmm. and um, really a nice guy. He he's very nice, and we didn't realize that that road behind our main parking lot is a private drive. Yeah, it switches from a, a county road to a private drive uh-huh. just right about. And so this was this is. was we should have checked that out earlier and told people about that, uh, not you know not to go out that way and use that drive, but to come back toward our building. So that was. That was uh, our fault on that. We should have already checked that out. But during that uh, that conversation, and then Mike went to that next Monday a Diggin City Council meeting because um, we had to try to figure out what are we going to do because trash trucks go through our back part, 
parking lot to pick up trash on that private drive. I don't know that it's wide enough maybe for them to turn around. But anyway, uh, we were trying to figure out, okay, what could we do? Um, And we thought of we can put up a chain link fence with wide gates and leave it open except for when we have a conference. But we need to wait for them to recut that because they're going to be doing lots of work. Right, and that's what Mike found out is that they're going to have to do a lot of work back there because the (laughs) culverts – I think are collapsing, and so they're going to have to do that. Also found out they got a grant with the city where they're planning on adjacent to that, uh, our parking area. They're, going, they're thinking about putting in a park. Yeah, they're going to have to because with all the const- – I mean, we, we found out where there's a whole lot more construction than we oh, ever yeah. dreamed of. I, I, we and didn't have a clue what's coming because they're going to – it's going to split Dickens in half. It's going to turn uh, Highway 60 out in front of our building into an into interstate. An interstate which does a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, the, the Amish can't go on the interstate, which is, is a relief to me because I just cringe every time I see a semi going by one of those buggies with little kids in it. And they'll actually be, have to go on this outer road they're going to build in front of our building where they have to take part of our land. And so the, um, <coughs> what's getting ready to happen is so much uh, road construction and things that we're not going to be able to have a, a fall conference um, that was pretty clear with what Mike found out. Um, we're going to even have to figure out the back way out of here because <laughs> I'm not sure I know. I, I think we went a long time ago, went around the back, but it's kind of like a maze. And so I'm not exactly sure. I mean, we're going to be coming in the back way. And I'm, we I'm can, sure by the time we find the way out, we will also find Waldo. <laughs> <laughs> we could. We might be able to. Um, but that was one of the things we found out. There's no way we can try to have people come through this kind of construction. It, we were worried a little bit about when they were uh, doing an overpass at Rogersville because if you're coming from Springfield, you have to come through there. But they made that fairly easy to get through. And I'm assuming since this is going to be an Internet, they're going in, to – Internet. Everything's on my mind this morning, Internet. Um, they're going to have to take out those two stoplights. Stoplights, and I'm not even sure about the I don't crossing think, here. I don't think we'll have a crossing here. No. So it's a lot we're going to have to, to pray about as we go on, but it, it was obvious we can't have one in the fall. And um, so it's all right because that's going to give us time to pray about the election and the changes that are coming up. You know, a lot of people are saying that they think um, that whoever wins – that there's going to be like a civil war over it. And so that's a lot we need to be praying about. Um, There's just a lot going on, I mean, all over the place. More and more is being exposed, and so uh, we've got a lot to pray about. And, um, you know, it just seems like, to me, (laughs) it's like we're in the plagues of Egypt. I've heard people saying for a long time, you know, it just doesn't seem like their prayers are getting answered. It's like we're in a, a desert period. And um, and I I thought it's kind of like the plagues, you know. We've had I saw one at, at my house, this huge hornet. I'm telling you, the biggest hornet I've ever seen in my life. Never seen one like it. Steffi saw one at her property, and I thought, my goodness, if you got in disturbed a nest of those things, whatever they are, I've never seen one like it. I mean, I'd, I'm just wondering if a person could survive the stings. I'm wondering if there's those because they were talking about on the west coast here about two or three years ago that these Japanese. Super Hornets had made it over into the cotton. I wonder if that's one of these because I've never seen one this big ever. Well, it, it was huge. And so, you, and you know, we got all these cicadas out. Ah, oh, it's the most agitating sound to me. You know, I, I think some of these insects and things are a result of the fall. It's kind of like those brown recluse spiders and things. You think, what earthly reason would they be here? I, I think there's some, something other than um, what God designed them to be. You know, most... Um, most insects you see the purpose of, and you know it's in the chain of the food chain of the insects and things. But boy, I'll tell you, these these cicadas are something else, and that it's it's a dis, it's not peaceful at all. You know, I can hear peep frogs, I can hear all kinds of things, but boy, when you go out, and I remember that one year um, back was, when it was over deafening. twenty years ago, we it it was deafening, and that was just two groups of them out. This year, there's three, so I kind of feel like it's the plagues of Egypt. You know, because of the sin, because there's been such gross sin, and it and it's continuing. I've never seen people fight so hard to be able to destroy babies in the womb in my life. Um, but I, I know that God, God's been talking to me about His mercy, um, because that's what is, is disturbing to me is when you have this many people fighting for such a horrible thing. 
you just think, God, how can you hold back? And and the truth is, is uh, this is my opinion. I believe judgment's already been released, and I think God's mercy has been um, protecting us and stopping things. And I wanted to read a little bit about because I, I kept thinking about God's amazing mercy. You know, we'll hear amazing grace. We'll hear all these things, but His mercy is amazing, Mike. It is. It's. And the Bible says His His mercies are new every morning. Thank God. Yeah, that's right. And I wanted to read Deuteronomy seven nine says, "Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations." Psalm twenty five ten. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Now notice what it's saying about those that keep his covenant. <laughs> you know, that, that mercy would not be extended to those that, that don't. That's why I think that we're getting ready to see judgment on the wicked. Um, Proverbs twenty eight thirteen says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Isaiah thirty eighteen says, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they uh, that wait for him. <coughs> and so, you know, there's a lot of, of scripture right there that we can stand on during these times because um, it's just one thing after another. I think that's why everybody's everybody we've talked to, their, their insurance is just going up and up. We just got our house insurance bill, and it's up $100 and a little bit over $100 more than it was last year. And I think it's there, because there's there so many disasters. These insurance companies are are canceling people. Yeah, we just heard from one of our friend ministries that right before they were doing their kids' camp, oh, we're canceling your insurance, mm -hmm. and never a problem with them or anything else. I'd, so at the last minute trying to do that because, you know, you'd be, you have to have insurance for liability when just, you've got just, kids there. I, I think that insurance companies are going in survival mode, and they, they may not even exist by the time all this is over with. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I mean, it's, it's trust God, period. Well, and, you know, throughout history, we've got example after example um, with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their, God's mercy was in, in the middle of even them being in captivity. Yeah. And so that's, I, I think it's one of the ways that God is going to show himself powerful to the world. You know, in, the, in this end time, um, I know that the Iran, I don't know what they call him. He was the president. Is it a president? The Ayatollah is the highest, right? Ayatollah is the religious leader than... And the president is the secular leader, and it was the president that died in some of his cabinet. And so, thank God that they've they've said that that was an accident because that would have really escalated things over in Israel. But you know, time and time again, I don't care what anybody says about you know the Rothschilds and Israel, and it's not the real Israel and all that. They can say all that, but God has proven over and over again that He shows Himself powerful to protect Israel. And one of the reasons is because that's. That's where he did everything. And if he, you know, he, he's showing people that the, the God of Israel is more powerful than anything else to draw people to him. You know, when the, the, we're talking with Carl, uh, Zev Parad is, is a good friend of his, and, and he's become a good friend with me, and he lives in Israel. The Parad family is very high as far as leadership in Israel. Uh -huh. And uh, when, when uh, Zev got saved, I mean, he walked away from a lot. And... He would go and he would try to, you know, share the gospel and everything, and and people just would turn him off, almost spit at him. Since October sixth, over there, people are coming up to him and saying, "Tell me about this Yeshua." I don't know how many people. In fact, there was a top rabbi over there that he just led to the Lord within the last year, that had to resign from his synagogue, the major synagogues in, in Israel. But he also led his associate rabbi to the Lord, and now they have a messianic ministry in Israel. And it's come, I mean, they had such a reputation, it's, it's got people's uh -huh. attention. God, in, in, all the, in all the chaos, Mary, God is moving and he's calling his people back to himself and he's calling them back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's amazing what God is doing. And we need that, we need that all over because I've heard so many testimonies in of people that say that that they thought their mother was saved, or they thought this person was saved because they, you know, this one man said his his uh, mother 
play the piano in church, you know, as long as he could remember. Was there three days and a week? And so God was telling him that she knows of him, but she doesn't know him. And uh, so he said it just wrecked him because he, you know, he just couldn't couldn't believe. It. But when he talked to her, then then he led her through to salvation. And I've thought, you know, we've had such a watered down gospel. Yes, we and have. And we've had so many attempts of the enemy. I think I think it's one of his key strategies here in the end times is to get people to think they are saved when they don't have that relationship. And it, like the quote that always comes to mind when we talk about this was the, the book that John MacArthur wrote on the gospel according to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And in it, he said, he said, and this is he's zeroed in on the Baptists. He said the problem with the Baptists is ninety two percent of them aren't saved. And I'm I'm even seeing uh, books come on the evangelical market on how do you lead someone to the Lord that thinks they're a Christian, but they're not. Well, I mean, that, that, that's, that get, that's getting challenge. to be a, a major thing because relig- religion and a watered-down gospel has, and using emotionalism instead of, instead of conviction, I mean, just a lot of things, has caused people to think they're saved and they're not. And it, could, it, it comes back down to, do you have a relationship Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus said, listen, in the last days you'll say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this in your name, that in your name? And he said, I never knew you. He didn't say, I knew you, then I forgot you. He said, I'd, you, you never had that relationship with me. Well, I always um, am concerned when I see someone that claims to be a Christian, and you can't see any love anywhere around them. Yeah. You know, they could, they may be able to spout all kinds of things and, and um, have amazing things going on, but you don't see love, and that's that's just the number one sign to me. If you can't feel Jesus, if you can't feel the love of God, it just concerns me. Yeah. And 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 to think of that, okay, you've got to try to convince somebody that they're not saved when they've been told by the churches they are. And I've had the experience of trying to tell someone that they need deliverance. <laughs> And they're sitting there. You, who do you think you are? I've been in in the way for you know forty years. Yeah, you have been in the way. <laughs> <laughs> and but it's it's really a serious situation. It is. It is, and uh, one of the things God has been dealing with me about. You know, we we've, we've had to deal with a lot of things. You know, we've had to deal with mind control. We've had to deal with Genesis six and the Nephilim, and, and and it's so easy to get so caught up in all of that that we don't take care of the basics. Mm-hmm. And God has been dealing with me that there there needs to be a blending of both. We we have so many people that let's say get into Hebraic heritage and they're they're learning the commandments of God and everything, but somehow they forgot Jesus in the mix. And I mean, the the enemy on every level is trying to get us away from our very foundations. Mm-hmm. And we we we've, we've got to return back to a balance of practical Christian living of walking with Jesus as well as understanding the times that we're living in. And I think that's one of the things that I'm I'm kind of working through as a as I'm working on this next book is to have a blending of both because it's real easy to do, you know I could do a Shinar Directive too, and this is all the enemy, this is all the enemy is doing, but you know what you can know the day the Antichrist is going to show up, you can know his name, you can know how many freckles are on the end of his nose, and not be ready because it, it's pressing into God, it's it's having that relationship with God. That uh, sometimes I think even in ministry, it's so easy to get caught up in ministry that you don't have the time that you need to really press into God the way it's, that you It's do. easy to do. That's why Jesus was constantly taking mm-hmm. his disciples away from the crowd. You know, I'm one of those people, when you get up in the morning, and I've learned to pray first before I get, get out of the bed even, um, but... I'm one of those people, if I've got something to do, it's like gun ho you know, just go get it done. And, well, you always want to get it done and out of the way. Uh-huh. But um, we we just got to press in now more than ever, I think, because I really feel like all of us are in some kind of a transition. I think that things are going to look much different one of these days, and I think that we need to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit to show us how to flow with that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's there's things we're, we're going to change, I know. <laughs> I know um, it looks like there's always an enormous amount of food here at the at the conferences, but I met some people that 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 showed them love. You know, that's one of the things that I know you can do that shows people love is pray over food and ask God to bless it and well, you let have it bless them. You have the gift of hospitality. Well, I don't know if I, I never have thought I've had that, but I just I just know the value of 
showing people that you care about them and fixing things that you know are special. That's why I try to have all the different diet needs things for them because they're they they're special and they need to know they're special to God. And so it's it's things like that that you can especially you know little kids. Yeah. They they just need to know that. You know we, it's like we had food running out of our ears because, I mean, you and Steffi do such a wonderful job. Now, most of the time during the conference, we never get to eat any because we're so busy with stuff. <laughs> well, I can't eat because it, <coughs> when I eat, my energy would go down, so I have to. But I, I, I think I averaged about one meal a day during the conference. <laughs> but the people, it, it showed that, that you really cared about them. I, I remember the first time that you, you introduced the, uh, the charcuterie board. Of course, it was like a charcuterie uh, table. They call it grazing table. Um, grazing table. <laughs> they, uh, the people just, it, they, they were touched by it because it, it showed how much you cared. Well, it's kind of, it was a big form of our family snack plate. <laughs> yes, it was. And so. 200 pound snack plate. <laughs> but, and, and see, that's important because there, there are some people that come. I remember when this conference, that was one last year that I found out afterward that they were so hungry to hear the word that they slept in their car. If we'd known and, that, we'd, if we'd have known that. I'd yeah. put them up in the hotel. Yeah, but, sure. but some people come that they can barely afford a hotel, or they can't they can't afford the food. That's why we do it the way we do. Yeah. Is I felt like there are people that need to to come together and need to hear the word, and you know, especially if you've got kids and things like that. It's just I just think it's a good thing. One of my one of my favorite memories uh, of the conferences I met. There were several families that came in together with all the little kids, and I met them at their door, and there was. Uh, John and Charlie and Abby, Abby, mm-hmm. and I met them at the door, and I said, "Mary got new stuffed animals," and you could just see their <laughs> eyes light up, and it's uh, things like that are, are just worth their weight in gold. They really are. Well, you just, I just want to see kids see the love of Jesus. I'm telling you, that goes a long way. That's why, like, you'll hear people later in their years talking about a Sunday school teacher that just made a point of of making them feel loved and. It's just important, and, and we're living in a rough world. We are. We're living in a, in a world where, where people, I, I don't know what what's happened in the last decades, but it's almost like people think it's a good thing if they are rude to people. You know, it's, it's almost like I think that they think that builds them up or something. And to me, it's just, uh, it's just the opposite of the way we're supposed to be. It is. You know, uh, during one of the praise and worship sessions, God had me give a, it was a prophetic word, but it was more of a word of exhortation, edification, and comfort. And in it, he said, I'm the Alpha and Omega. Of course, we know that the beginning and the end. But he said, I'm also the God in between. That in between the beginning and the end that I'm there. And it was really an exhortation to, to press into him. And as, as I was thinking about that this morning, he, he shared something with me that I never saw before. You know, Alpha and Omega. He's the creator, which is the beginning, and he's the judge, the one at the end. So he has the first word and the last word, but he, but he also fills. And this is one of the things that we see in the word. He, he fills all the in-between. That uh, I think sometimes in, we, we get so uh, wrapped up in like the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation or, the, uh, or you know, you know, who's the beast, who's the false prophet, all these things. But sometimes we... We miss over the encouragement of, of the book of Revelation. That although sin is at its zenith and you see this great conflict going through and, and God's pouring out judgment and all these things, those that are God's, he maintains through it all. He does. He maintains mm-hmm. through it all. And he knows what you have need of. You know, there are, there are people that uh, are able to store a lot of food. There are others that aren't. But you know what? God sees what you need. He does. And there's there's something happened. Um, you know, years ago, and I didn't even understand it all. I was just uh, heard God say that Satan had done something to move things a, a couple of degrees. And in that movement, that that shift that he was able to make, it was it was uh, made it very very difficult for people to, to hear God, to uh, answer prayer. It's like it, it took us out of alignment with heaven or something is the only way I know how to describe it. Well, it's shifting back. And I, I think that there are, <coughs> I know I've seen prayers answered here lately that I've been praying for for years. And I bet that it's, it's going to be that way for a lot of people, that they're going to see, oh, man, that, 
that prayer got answered. And it's because it's going to shift back. And I think that the reason that God has taken so much time is this shift affected so many things that this, this can be very disruptive for people as it shifts back. I think that it's going to be alarming to people. I think it's going to be encouraging to other people. But, but it's, it's a big shift that Satan was able, able to accomplish. And um, as it shifts back, we're going to see more miracles. We're going to we're going to hear God clearer. I think it's it's an amazing thing that God's doing. But you know, He was warning me back then. He said, "Now, when this eventually goes back to my my pattern, my design," He said, "It's going to be really hard on a lot of people." And so we just got to be ready. And um, you know, I, I it's I think we're going to be in that time where He's going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. I think there's going to be yes. massive amounts of numbers of salvation. I think that there's going to be miracles that we haven't seen. I think that, um, like I said, there's going to be prayers answered. I think that prayers are going to be answered quickly instead of like that toil, you know, you just feel like years you're just praying. Um, And I also believe that there's surplus on the way. You know, we never have seen that where the wealth of the wicked's laid up for the just. Well, I think it's going to be in the last days when we need it. I, I think too. we're going to be feeding massive amount of people. I think we're going to be able to share the gospel. I think things are going to be easier working in the kingdom of God for his purposes. But I think that there's going to be such a massive revolt in the kingdom of darkness. It's not going to be easy you know, for as, everybody. As I was meditating on, on what's getting ready to come, there, there have been seasons of it in the church. There was one time Dale Moody went over to, to uh, Great Britain and, and ministered. And I mean this, he was asked to go to this church, and I mean it was just dead. Uh, uh, it, was, it was like you know somebody struck a match, the whole thing would have burst into flames. And after he preached, he gave, them, he gave an altar call. The entire church, the board, the deacons, the elders, everybody went forward to get saved. I mean, there wasn't a, a, one single person except for the pastor. And he looked at the pastor and said, do you think they understood what I, what I meant? Of course, over there, you know, Calvinism was preached, so you never had an altar call. And so he said, listen, he, he said, everybody go back and sit down. And he did it again. He said, now, I want you to meet with me in the foyer after church. The entire church showed up that this pastor had an entire congregation that was religious but wasn't saved. Mm. And D.L. Moody led that entire congregation to the Lord in one service. Mm-hmm. And then he went on to the, you know, he was going on to the next church and they sent word that, that Sunday night said, you need to come back because there's no room for people and they're, they're crying out for God for salvation. Wow. <laughs> you see, we, we have had visitations like that in the past. And what's, what's interesting over in with, with that particular one with D.L. Moody, it started with people that thought they were Christians, but they didn't know the Savior. They were, they were Christians because they, they thought they were born Christians, or they were Christians because they were baptized as a baby, but they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And God began to give a clarion call uh, back for, for the, the, the basics of the gospel. It's that personal relationship. And, I mean, this is even encoded when you, you look at Psalms 91, uh, that secret place of the Most High is Jesus. Mm-hmm. Because what's interesting, when you go down to the very last verse, it says, and with long life will I satisfy him and I will show him my Yeshua in, in the Hebrew. But Jesus is that safe place. It's not a denomination. It's not a church. It's not a movement. It's not a ministry. It's got to be Jesus. I, I think there have been there has been a lot of riding coattails of others or thinking because I'm a member of this church, I'm fine because, you know, this guy is action-packed and, and super-powered or whatever. We're, we're, we're in a time that the because judgment is beginning to come, God's hands is beginning has, has been lifted off of America. It's going to come down to the individual, the individual household, the individual, that we have to make Jesus our refuge. I mean, when you read Psalms 91, it says that, it says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, and I will trust in, and he is my God, and I will put my trust in him. Then later on, he goes, listen, he said, listen, his truth shall be your shield and your buckler. It's time to return back to the word of God, not the pablum that, that's being offered today in so many churches that's this more 
of entertainment. It's more self-centered. It is. And, you know, we're supposed to be ambassadors. And if, if you put it in that, like if, if you thought about it in this way, that every time we go out anywhere, anytime we're, we're talking, we're supposed to represent Jesus. And I'll tell you, the, the number one thing I'm seeing a lack of is people being able to show love. Because if you can't, if, if they can't see a representative on the earth, show love. How in the world are they going to get a clear picture of Almighty God? Yeah. And, you know, I'll be, I'll be the first to, to admit that sometimes I get a stinking attitude because of everything that's going on. And, and just to, and God has been dealing with you. You need to let me get in there. Oh, we got to decrease and let him increase. It's oh, the only way because our flesh is just not with the program. <laughs> no, it's not. We've got to train it. And, We've got to subdue it. <laughs> and, and I'm finding he's Lord, whether I'm, I'm old and achy or whatever, that, that he's still Lord. But, you know, guys, take time to read Psalms 91 because, I mean, there, there, are, there are some, be- over and over again you, you hear because, because. In uh, verse 9, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. He shall give his angels charge over you. You go down to verse 14, because you have set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Because you've set your love on me, I will deliver you. And and I, I think it's, it's time for us all to take inventory. I, I know I'm having to do that. And it's a constant thing because it's so easy, guys, to get caught in ruts. Well, one, one misstep that any of us makes and hurts someone, especially a child, one misstep can affect the rest of their life. Yeah. And so we have to be very careful about it. And, and we've been so fortunate here with, like I said, the, the pastors that have come in here have been so kind to our grandkids. Um, just been it's just been so wonderful and I, I've appreciated that more than I could say and I I want any child that walks in this building to know that they're loved that yeah. they're they're precious to God I know with um after I had picked up Carl from the airport and we had dinner and stuff we were sitting on the car for they went in the hotel and he says no he said what's what's the schedule what's the protocol and I began telling him kind of what I had planned and he said my goal is to make things as easy on you as possible. You see, that's a pastor's heart. That, he he is. <laughs> that that's a and his wife heart. is like that. They're just wonderful pastors. You know, and he was talking about you know trying to get an Uber way out here in the middle of nowhere, yeah. and I said, "Oh, surely not." And he said, "Well, he said I actually called one time way down in Jim, you know, Jim Baker's show, and he said mm-hmm. way out in the middle of nowhere, and he said, "Hey, I'm just 15 minutes away. I'll come get you and take you to Springfield." And I thought, "Well, these are strange time Uber people are just <laughs> everywhere." <laughs> But it, it, I, I think there, there we, we need to seek, and, and I'm, I'm speaking to me just as much as I am anybody else, we're going to need God's grace for the days ahead. And, and to do that, we've got to let his grace soak into our more honorary parts of our life and where the, the, uh, the road of life is kind of wore it thin or wore it rough. Uh, we, we, we need his grace, and, and I, I'm becoming more cognizant of that than I ever have in my entire life, that, that wherever we allow his grace to go, there's a sustaining power that always comes with the grace. And how easy it is to forget that, Mary. How easy it is to forget that. And uh, it's one of those times where you get aggravated at yourself. You know, how did I get stuck on this stupid? How did I? Well, I think that's one of the... The strategies of the enemy. I think he wants to wear us down. I think he wants to get us in, you know, just so tired and so aggravated that that we can't walk that out. And I have to, I have to work on it every day. I never ever have a problem um, with children, never. But there have been times when, in the past, you know, the years that we've walked through something, I've got very aggravated at people. I've never said unkind words, but I, I hope my face didn't show. <laughs> I was thinking because I thought, oh, this just beats all. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think, I think we're all, God's going to be working on all of us to be that ambassador, to, yeah. to be that person that, you know, ready in season and out to where if somebody needs ministry, if we see somebody and they're not saved, um, 
I just think he's, I think we're going through a transition out of a self-centered world that we've all been raised in into a Jesus-centered world. <coughs> Which is the exact the opposite. The exact opposite. I, and I know that I've been um, starting to pick up uh, some old books, uh, ones like with Andrew Murray, uh, Abiding in Him, and, and it's, it's like, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. And I, I think we have been so, uh, not just us, but I think the body of Christ as whole, we've been so caught up in the feeling touchy stuff that it's so easily manipulated that we, we have left the basics, and the basics are where we get our strength. Well, it's that abiding in Christ. God is so merciful, though. Can't you see even with what's going on in the body of Christ all around us? He's He's showing mercy. He's saying, "Look at this. Yeah, take a look at this." He's just so wonderful. I mean, he is, and I, I think he even lets the uh, the things that ruffle your feathers. You know, it ruffles them. It doesn't rip them out. Okay, mm-hmm. he, it ruffles them so that it's hey, this is a wake up call. This it's uh, I'm, I'm beginning to look at things that. Uh, if it rubs me the wrong way, then I've got to stop and say, okay, now how did I react in that? And was that Christ-like or was that something that the old Mike Lake that needs to be crucified? And I think he's doing that across the board. I think that there are certain situations that's coming up in ministry and different things that if, if, we're, if we're doing it right, we're going to step back and say, okay, I need to analyze. And I need to make sure where Jesus is in this and every, every bit of that, Mary, is the grace of God. And I, I think some ministries are seeing it. I think some ministries are missing it. I know when uh, we ran across something here not too long ago, and everybody's been kind of watching what's uh, been happening with IHOP in Kansas City, and one of the things that I have said is, you know, if all these people were, for, for pred- were, were prophetic, how come none of this was called out? Well, it was. Uh, that at the beginning, Derek Prince went up there and and he said, these are some things, I mean, at the very foundation of these, some things that are off, it just wasn't received. And I, I wonder how many Derek Princes that God is releasing across the body of Christ that can very gently call out things and saying, listen, there's, there, there, there needs to be an adjustment. I, I think that's part of, of the prophetic. The prophetic isn't just about saying, you know, you're going to be wonderful and you're going to be the next apostle, Paul. And it's, it's like there's always those kind of prophetic words. But I've always seen a prophet that has a plumb line that's always connected to the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And he looks at the plumb line and what you're building and says, you guys are three degrees off. If you keep building, by the time you reach the end of it, you're going to be 50 degrees off. And it's time to straighten it back up. Mm -hmm. And I I think he's going to begin loosing that uh, in the body of Christ. And I think he'll do it in in a gentle way. Yeah. Because um, I've seen prophetic words that were too harsh. Yeah. And there's no sense in just tearing somebody up. You know, it's just just gently pointing out. You know, this and that. And um, I just I think we're all going through a process to where we can be ambassadors. <laughs> um, we, you know, if you ever talk to people that have been overseas. And, and they'll tell you stories of, like, people walk miles and miles just to hear the Word of God. Just different stories. And then you come back over here, and it's so different. And you think, well, no wonder they see miracles over there. You know, it's a different atmosphere. It, it is. But I think that the, the affluence that comes with Laodicea, yeah. it's so easy to lean on over on that. But that constantly taints us. It, it uh, beefs up the flesh. Mm-hmm. It really does, and it causes us to. It, it's not. It's not our wealth, or that where we live in America that is our refuge. It's the Lord is our refuge, mm-hmm. regardless of the economy around us, regardless of the politics around us. We need to have a a Christianity that is beyond politics. Well, we have we have a fallback. They always have provided us with a fallback. We have insurance. Yeah. There may be a time when they don't. There's no such thing as insurance because they can't. Nobody can afford it. You know, if they just keep going it, up because go there's, up. there's so many disasters. You know that that they, the insurance companies can't can't handle it. And so, so we we've got to start looking 
to our Father as our provider, as our defender, all the things that he is, that, that the word shows us, and he shows it to us personally over and over and over. That's what we've got to, to get to, because how can we give hope to the world when we can't see that in our own lives? You know, down at here, the watchman, there was a guy there that taught uh, people that were going to be actuaries, like in insurance. He taught it at uh, Grand Canyon University. And, and he was talking with an insurance agent and said, well, we know that there's more you know, stuff going on, but that's not the real reason the rates are going up, is that we have a lot of young people dying that the real gravy train, if you will, for insurance is whole life insurance that you pay for. And, and so, you, you, so they're, they're making income off of that until you're 70, 80 years old, okay? And so they're making 10, 15, 20, 30 times what they're going to pay out. They're making because they're maintaining that money. And now all of a sudden we have a lot of people dying early. And if I said the reason I thought why, we'd, we'd get censored mm-hmm. on some of the things. But there are so many of them dying early that uh, that the gravy train or the reserve money that the insurance companies would have is all evaporating. Oh, I think this is the tip of the iceberg, what we're I seeing. Do. I walked in... Uh, a store the other day and was going to get a container of coconut oil, just the liquid kind. We have a lot of the, you know, the big barrels of that that I keep. But I like I like for just quick purposes just to have that there if I'm going to, you know, fry an egg or something. And in two weeks, from one time I, I looked at how much it was to the next, it had raised one bottle, $2. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are insane increases and so there's no way that we're not going to come to some kind of a you know critical mass point here Uh, but i i do think that god has plans to where his people can have surplus in the midst of this it's going to look impossible but he does impossible things and this is nothing that's going on is a surprise to him whether he's got to cause the widow's flour and oil not to run out um, but you know, one of the things I have found out about any government, not just the U.S. government, they will obfuscate things because they don't want to create panic. And there's a lot of other reasons. But uh, I have noticed since the 1960s, I've been kind of keep a watch on this, on how they calculate inflation. They keep on taking things away from the inflation markers. And one of the reasons is that inflation rate is what they go by on increasing Social Security and if they would have maintained what they, back in the 1960s, what they calculated, because what food and gasoline and several other things, they no, and I think even housing, they no longer calculate into the in inflation rate. That if they left it the way it was in the 1960s, people drawing Social Security would be drawing five times what they're drawing now. And so they keep, they keep subtracting from that and saying, well, see, inflation's only at 5%. It's only... Well, you and I have seen many food items, the price has doubled over the last mm-hmm. two or three years. And so in, inflation is a lot higher. But we, we need to realize that my hope can never be in who's going to be sitting in president or, or on the cabinet or, or even in Congress because it's, it's a mess that only God can fix. It really is. But my hope is that Jesus Christ is on the throne and that he's ruling and reigning and that he can sustain me and sustain you regardless of what's going on. That he can show me now on things to do. We, we, we see in the New Testament that we had prophets speak up before a famine happened so that the body could begin preparing and that churches outside the famine area were collecting offerings to send into those that were famine because God has his own government. He does. He has his own economy. It supersedes this one. It supersedes everything else. And th- this this is a time to learn to really trust in God more than anything else. Well, the, the last time I heard, don't we have a huge amount of oil here in the United States? I mean, they I think they didn't they just shut it down and oh, just yeah, say they, we're not going to we, because we they have, keep going to Saudi Arabia, right? We have more oil. Uh, in fact, one of them, what was that chaplain Lindsay talked about that they had found one up in Alaska eclipses anything in the Middle East. They capped it off and said, well, one of these days we'll, we'll cap that. We have, we have several like that in the United States. Plus they have found that some of the uh, oil wells that we had thought had run dry, they regenerated. Because we, you know, we always thought it was, you know, it was the dinosaurs or whatever vegetation. Now they're beginning to find out that the magnetic 
uh, properties of the earth actually generates oil. So a part of the natural uh, underground stuff of how this planet works is it takes what's underneath and it, it replenishes the oil. Well, there probably are big deposits of gold throughout the nations. And yeah. there's all kinds of things that God can do. I mean, he's not limited by anything. And so, so it's time for us to just say, Father, increase my faith. Help me. Yeah. Help me. Help my unbelief and, and help us get established because that's one of the things that I'm, I'm positive of is that God is going to show himself powerful through miracles, through provision. And I know things look really rough, but I, I'm very encouraged. I, I just think God's got a plan. And our our biggest task here is figure out what exactly you want us to do. Yeah, We'll do it. As soon as we know and it's confirmed, we'll do anything God says. And I, I think that needs to be at the heart of, of all of us. And to show you how far God thinks ahead. And this was a scientific report that just came out this last year that deep in the earth, like two, three, four miles, there's enough fresh water to refill every ocean. And it, there's, you know, when Jesus comes back, he's going to basically have to kind of terraform the earth because you have, you know, the water systems are poison and all that, and there's so much going on. When Jesus comes back, there's already in the earth everything that he needs to heal the earth. They have, they have found that one of the largest aquifers, underground aquifers, in the Middle East is under the Mount of Olives. And when he comes back, he splits the Mount of Olives wide open and releases all that water into Israel. Guys, if, if God is powerful enough to... He already has everything in the earth. He doesn't have to create anything. Well, he had for that the, all planned at creation. For, I mean, it was all there. He, there's, there's, he doesn't have to create anything to usher us in, in, into the millennial reign. Everything that he has to heal and restore the earth, he put in the earth before man ever set foot on the earth. Now, if we serve a God that is so wise and so intelligent that he can do that, and he can plan. Uh, uh, one of the things that blows me away with when you, you've got to see Carl Gallup's stuff when we print yeah. out because Boy, there's a the entire there. story of the cross is in the first line. Now, we won't tell you everything because it's, it's really something you've got to see. It, it's a, the Word of God is a supernatural mm-hmm. book. We serve a super, supernatural God. If God is that detailed, I can trust him now. That's right. And the only reason that I may not, may not be experiencing is because I have always had a backup plan, you know, because, you know, we live in America and you know, the economy is yeah. good and this, that, and the other. We have backup plans to the backup plans. <laughs> we have, and I, I think what we need to do is, is say, God, help me forget about Babylon and just trust in mm-hmm. you. And thank him for his amazing mercy. And his amazing mercy and his grace. And, the Word of God says that he, that we as his sheep can hear his voice. Mm-hmm. Now, the first place that we hear it is in the Word. And we're going to have to go back to the Word. If the Word, if his truth is our shield and buckler, then we've got to go back because there's a lot of stuff being preached today that is not the Word of God. No, it's not. It, it, it's, it's, it's man's traditions. It's, it's man's pablum. It's, it's, it's changing one. the Word to fit a person's agenda. It is. And so we've got to go back to the Word. And whatever God says in the Word, that's it. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. And if I feel different than the Word says, then guess which one has to change? I've got to change. Yeah, I've, got, right. I've got to crucify that and bring my life in the Word. And I think the more that we line up with the Word, that causes us to line up more with Jesus. And the more we line up with Jesus, the more the kingdom can flow. And that's how we're going to make it in the days ahead. That's that's the that because of his mercy, he can adjust us now. And thank God he can change us. Oh, thank, thank God. God for that. You know, there, I've got many things I want changed, and I I walked this out during this conference. I told Steph, I said we have experienced supernatural strength from God, um, and he, he can do anything. We just have to to get our mind set on. Heavenly things instead of earthly things because it's, you know, the way our societies went, they, they act like you're an idiot 
if you don't do all the backup plans. Well, you got to have insurance for this, and, and you have to go and do exactly what the doctor says, and you better do this and this and this, or your, your medical insurance won't cover it. My goodness, we're getting ready to go through such a transition on that. And when we get to the end of this, there will be a bride worthy of our bridegroom. Yeah. What are we going to do when insurance says, if you don't take the mark of the beast, we can't cover you? Yeah, well, ta-ta. <laughs> ta-ta, yeah. <laughs> that's enough of that. And so it, it's, it's in Christ alone. Yeah, that's Christ right. Christ alone. Right. And He's fa- so worthy. And Father, we just ask that you would give every single one of us grace, Father, to examine our lives and to see where Jesus is not and to bring him there and to make sure that it's Jesus alone in us that he's our hope of glory, that we exude him in every area. And Father, I know what that calls for. You hand us a nail and you hand us a hammer and you say, nail it to the cross. Help us, Father. Help us, Jesus. God, give us the grace to do that. And we ask that you would just loose an anointing on every one of us. Father, to crucify what we need to crucify and to bring Jesus into every area of our life, into every room of our life, into our attitudes, into our thought life. Father, let us be like a Sherlock Holmes that that investigates every area of our life, and we're rooting out Babylon. We're getting rid of it and returning to the purity of the kingdom. We know that we cannot do it without your anointing. We know that we cannot do this without your grace and your spirit. And Father, we're crying out for mercy. We're crying out for grace. Father, we're crying out for that anointing that breaks every yoke. That we could be we, that we could see the image of Christ restored in us, spirit, soul, and body. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.